Okay, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the 40th CCSS meeting. Hope you are doing well at your ends. Although we still cannot meet in person, that's the weird, but we are working very hard on the infrastructure to host our meeting in, in a hybrid version. Hopefully we can meet more and more of you in person at our center after summer. Guess you also miss our lunch. Anyway, and every challenge is an opportunity. Thanks to the online formats, we could get in touch with the top specialists without distance to discuss the topic of this academic year, scaling in complex systems. Today, we are very happy to have Professor Mark Tim from Dresden University of Technology. And he's going to tell us more about the universe, universality, growth, and scaling in complex dynamical systems. Before that, our director, Professor Hank Dekstra, would like to introduce our speaker to all of you. Hank, please go ahead. Yeah, so welcome, Mark, uh, and glad that you are willing to, uh, to talk to us this afternoon. So uh, Professor Mark Timmer, um, he's a, a TU Dresden strategic professor and chair for network dynamics, which he has at this post since 2017. Uh, he got his PhD in 2002 in the University of Göttingen, if, I, if I've read it well uh, on the web. And then, um, say, uh, held positions also at uh, Cornell University and also at the TU of Darmstadt. His research is, is mostly on developing and using methods from statistical physics, nonlinear dynamics, stochastic processes and time series analysis to look at uh, cooperative phenomena in uh, large networks. And so that's... Uh, Many of us are interested in this kind of topics. So we're really looking forward to your talk, Mark. Go ahead. Thank you much. Thank you for the nice introduction. And uh, also thanks for the um, overall picture setting. Um, when I, I just mentioned in the, in the short round, in a small round that I, I just finished preparing this talk and I noticed after I, I shared the slides that the title is still the old title, so it's not exactly matching, but it still fits because what is actually going on is we are observing systems and we want to understand what they do. So it's an inference problem. It's different from, uh, from, the, from the question when you have a given model and you analyze the model. And so I'm, I'm actually talking about inference today, which is an inverse problem in, well, network systems in general, but the first, two teasers will be non -ne not necessarily networks. The, the main results I'll present today are work with uh, Malte Schröder, and the second part with application is uh, with Malte and Nora Molkenty. Um, I'm starting with a teaser just to get you on board and also to get you a bit curious about the problem I, I'll cite. It's called the North Pole problem, and it is about a purely mathematical problem. I attended a conference ages back uh, called Stochastic Eigen Analysis at MIT. And uh, people presented a curious phenomenon I will tell you uh, right now. And they, they originally presented numerical results one year and where I wasn't attending. And then the year later, they. The, another person presented proof why that numerical result is as it is. And in an audience of 40 uh, random rotation experts, random matrix experts, um, I was asking whether anyone can explain me as a physicist to intuitively what's going on and no one could. So, and um, Martin and I finally solved that problem. I'll just sketch it because it's also related to the scaling topic um, and it's very interesting I think. So imagine you have a circle, which is a, a sphere in two dimension and you apply a random rotation. And what you do before applying it, you mark the North Pole. So you mark one point on the circle. You apply a random rotation and by construction, every point on the circle is a possible outcome for the image of the North Pole. So the, the point I mark is called, I, I name it North Pole, and then I ask where the, what the image is. Now, 
I do a double rotation, but I don't do any random double rotation, but I do repeat the initial one. I took one rotation and I repeat the initial one. For a circle, it's very simple because it just mapped by two theta. If the original one was theta, I just create two theta. For high dimensions, it's harder. However, in, in, uh, in, a, in 2D, you get again a uniform distribution of the points as you might expect. Now you do the same in three dimensions. You pick a random rotation. You can think of taking a globe, like a plastic globe uh, full of air. You throw it into the air and pick it up again. And you, then you ask, where's the North Pole? And you do it 10,000 times and ask, what's the distribution of the North Pole after a random rotation? Rotation in, in three dimensions is more complicated, not just the turning by an angle. It's also all kinds of configurations. So you can imagine you have somehow two angles, um, like you, you move the axis of the, of the ball and then you turn about the axis. Um, what, you happen, what happens if you repeat the same rotation twice and you ask for the distribution of double images, like two applied, the image after two applications of the same rotation, you observe that the points here seem to cluster a bit around the original North Pole. So they seem to be denser up here in the Northern Hemisphere than they are in the lower. Um, so possibly is there a non-uniform distribution of images of North Poles if you apply it twice? This was a question and you, we can quantify that of course. You can ask what the distribution is and this is just a measurement from many realizations of these random rotations. They are, mathematically they are called isotropic rotations. And you do the same oh, and you can quantify the question saying what, where are the North Poles? Are they more on the northern hemisphere or on the southern hemisphere? Um, as a probability of the projected uh, image being aligned with the unit vector into that direction where you originally marked the North Pole. So is the probability of, of that image lying in the northern hemisphere, which is this larger than zero, equal or larger than one half? So naively you would expect it's one half. And if you actually measure that for three dimensions, you find, no, it's not. After one rotation it is, after two, it's not. Um, and I don't give you an explanation because that's not the topic of today, but I, I'll show you, first of all, that after one rotation it is exactly what you wanted to have. So you're, you pick the right ensemble of rotations R. Um, but as for after two, you get 71% approximately of the results ending up in the Northern Hemisphere. So there's a symmetry breaking going on. And you can quantify that. You can ask what is the fraction of ending up in the Northern Hemisphere as a function of the dimension of space. And interestingly, at, as we saw for D equals two, you are at 50-50, so there's no symmetry breaking. For D equals three, you're at 71. And for in the limit of infinite dimension, you again converge to one half, which uh, we found curious. And somehow three seems to be special. Yeah, and we in the paper, which is a 2019 physical review research paper by Malte Schröder and me, um, we try to analyze both the result for three dimensions and the scaling for large dimensions. And we found that the difference to one half is actually decaying as one over square root of two pi d, where d is the dimension of space. And as I said, it's not the topic of today, but I, I want to make you curious that this random rotation North Pole problem is actually also related to a scaling problem. And for this particular case, although it wasn't, it wasn't intuitively clear for approximately a decade, um, it is it is analytically feasible to, to estimate the scaling relation. In general, our group is focusing on networks, uh, most of all because networks are everywhere. And now we have lots of data and constraints for modeling them. And most of the, the networks play a role in their dynamic property, like what is the collective dynamics of them. And uh, many people have been working last century already on social networks and on neural circuits, for example. Now we are more and more 
focusing on gene and protein regulation networks, chemical reaction networks, and transport and distribution networks. And the latter one is actually what I'll briefly mention in the second part of my talk. Um, how do new forms of human mobility constitute a quantitative challenge to analyze them and what can how can scaling help um, in general we are as i said focused also on inverse problems which um, ask a reverse question you have some kind of observed dynamics and you want to find structure or more generally um, you want to find um, features of the system from your observation and this is what what scaling is about there's a chat news i don't know where sometimes it hosts um to read it so today I, i'll talk about scaling which is related to this inverse problem and i also talk about um network public mobility where we entered the field a couple of years ago and have first public first higher level publications um since uh well last year essentially now i can't click oh, no, okay in general all of these network dynamic systems come with challenges for theoretical analysis and one of the main challenges is the simultaneous occurrence of several of the following they are typically non-linear either the, the units which interact or the interaction functions like the interaction coupling strengths or something um, they are high dimensional by their very nature they have many interacting components they have typically complicated network connectivity and i address in particular the first three items today and in many systems you also have interaction delays strong heterogeneities by which i mean non-uniformities in space or parameters and stochasticity by me by which i mean also some kind of randomness but in time a common approach is to average stuff out so you for example if you're interested in the blue in a in a in a group of of network systems where their topology are described by something like the blue graph in the middle here um do you see my mouse maybe yeah no, thank you um what people tended to do until the end of uh, last century is averaging out stuff and getting rid of the topology just don't mind what the topology is just say roughly it's like that for example if you if you consider the average state a thermodynamic description of um, of a gas you are you can say okay there are some interactions each molecule is interacting with a number of other other molecules in a certain time frame but on average somehow they are interacting in the field they are interacting with all the other molecules uh, proportionally to the number and and whatever depending on density and so on, temperature so we can make models which more or less look like the left here which is an all or all effective coupling and if you're more advanced you do something like a local coupling okay it's, you, you you take into account that local molecules only interact with other local molecules and not with some more distant ones and you get these kinds of models and that's true for all kinds of topics we i, I was first introduced to this type of thinking in uh, neuroscience mathematical neuroscience where the question was can you can you model the activity of of neural tissue and it was actually considered as tissue as not as network like it's, it's a smooth space which more looks like this local structure regular structure and the topic of our group since then since my phd is to mind individual links individual events on in the system and individual realizations so it's for us it's not the same to say you have a random network in the sense of an ensemble and take the average property but rather to ask what a given network realized from that ensemble would yield as a dynamical property so in this sense we take a systemic view of the entire thing but we, we keep details of what is realizing the entire thing um my postdoc supervisor steven strogatz who is who is one of the top network researchers because he was introducing 
the, the concept of a model of small worlds and explaining small world phenomena with them, together with Duncan Watts. In his uh, 1994, I think, textbook, he has a <clears throat> table illustrating um, the complexity of systems. And he, he has two axes to this um, table. One is the number of variables, and the other one is the degree of nonlinearity. Of course, you can fight of what it exactly means, but number of variables is pretty clear, and also linear is clear, and nothing, things that are nonlinear are not linear, so it's also clear. And uh, he was pointing, <clears throat> he, was, he was putting this dashed line here, which is, he calls the frontier, um, separating more or less relatively simple phenomena and relatively complex phenomena in the sense that several of these are not understood. For example, cell dynamics, uh, complex materials, neural circuits, and so on, and, and public transport, they are not understood, whereas RC circuits may be complicated, but in principle they are understood also the same for wave equations and so on. Um, many of the basics here, all the basics essentially are understood, and all of the basics here, or many of the basics are not understood. Um, I, I'd like to, and that interestingly, this dashed line didn't change a lot. Um, it didn't drift towards the lower right so much because these systems are really complex and they have a, a one more axis which wasn't considered at that time, which is the, the network topology and, and all kinds of heterogeneity. So things I mentioned on the previous slide. There's a, at least one third dimension which is the interaction patterns between these. Um, it is much simpler to analyze, for example, a periodic solid like a crystal um, because it's periodic and there are sim relatively simple theories for analyzing um, these systems, also for getting model building models for these systems. Whereas for networks, um, there are all kinds of individual approaches, but there's no, so far, there's no consistent approach which, which I, I can just take from, a, from my toolbox and then apply it and I will get a result. Like not like a, yeah, not like solid state uh, structural physics. And my plan for today, it's uh, talking about scaling analysis, both on the theoretical side, and I'll explain some theoretical challenges and on one application. I first will confuse you by two simple examples. So examples are chosen very simple on purpose, and still I hope to be able to confuse you a bit. Um, and please interrupt me if, if you are confused, um, or if it's too simple and you're not confused, then I can stop the talk. Second, um, I will work out the differences between scaling concepts, and now I close the window. I'll work out the difference first between scaling concepts, underlying these two examples, I will, uh, I hopefully, will reverse the confusion so everything looks simple at the end after step three. And my goal function is that you, you tell me, oh, wh why did you do it in the first place? That's all completely simple. And um, the fourth point is the question how both can be useful, like both scaling concepts, in particular in combination, how can you apply it? If you, for example, have data and you want to extract certain um, certain uh, features from those data, you that's I will go for a theoretical conceptual perspective and not talk about technical details like what happens if you have too noisy data or too few data points, whatever. Um, and then I, I show you one application in a complex system, and I choose the collective dynamics of right pooling systems. And then I, I'll thank those who are still awake. So what is scaling? If I ask what is scaling, I actually have to ask, what do we mean by scaling? Or each person can ask, what do I mean by scaling now for this problem? And I, I expand on this seemingly detailed uh, nitpicking aspect by providing examples. So the first example is uh, ferromagnetism. I'm physicist by training, so one of the first 
statistic physics features you, you learn is that if you put many elementary magnets or spins uh, together and you cool it down sufficiently and you have a certain type of interactions, which is called ferromagnetic interactions, then you would get ferromagnetism. So you would get an emergent magnetism of the entire solid or body, um, which arises from zero, no magnetism at high temperature, it arises at a certain critical temperature, and then it goes, uh, it increases further to, um, to one, to 100% maximum magnetization if you, once you cool the system down. Of course, this is now a highly idealized model and, and data also uh, simulated from a model. Um, but I, I would just like to illustrate the point. So at large temperature, beyond some critical temperature, you have zero magnetization. At low temperature, you have high magnetization and you have a continuous change with some typical scaling here. And that's a typical approach in physics and in several other fields of analysis. You talk about the scaling of, a, of an observable, a macroscopic observable typically as a parameter. And here I take the reduced difference to a critical temperature um, varies. So what is the scaling of that? And what you write for that is you say M, the magnetization is scales as Tc minus T, so Tc is a critical temperature, minus temperature T divided by Tc, so you take a relative value to some critical, so-called critical exponent beta. You, you write that, and what you mean by that is this. You mean that the limit of the logarithm of M divided by the logarithm of epsilon, where epsilon is this quantity in the brackets here, as epsilon to zero, so as t to tc, for example, oh, sorry, this way, from lower uh, values, that limit is equal to beta. So the finding the exponent, but first of all, finding that the exponent exists, so this limit exists, and second, quantifying that exponent is a was a typical activity in statistical physics of standard physical systems in the last century and it still is in, in complex systems analysis data science and complex systems physics socioeconomic systems um, today so that's a typical thing you write that m scales like something to a power of some exponent and you mean this okay logarithm divided by logarithm and this is why if you plot these quantities in double logarithmic axis so a logarithmic reduced temperature scale and a logarithmic magnetization scale in the limit of this quantity going to zero you have a roughly uh, the system or the, the measurements approach um, a straight line okay this is just what you mean by dividing the logarithms taking the limit so it's a completely natural usage of um, scaling, which is indicated by this similarity sign. There's a second um, mathematical approximation. It's called Stirling approximation. I have an one I too much, sorry, um, to the factorial function. The factorial function n is just n times n minus one times n minus two and so on. And for large n, it's hard to compute. So one one way you want to compute it is compute a good approximation. And what, as a physicist, and I think also as a mathematician, in one of your first semesters, you learn there's a Stirling approximation, which um, you also write um, this, sorry. You write uh, the, uh, the factorial of n is similar, whatever this means to the square root of two pi n, e to, to minus n, exponential function minus n, n to the n. And what you mean here is not the same as on the previous slide. You rather mean that the ratio of these two quantities converges to one. In other words, that if you take sufficiently large n, that the relative error is very small, okay? Note that if you cross out the prefactor here, two pi, square root of two pi, 
you would end up with a ah, yeah so this also uh, is considered natural usage and if you do it right you get the correct approximation so the ratio actually goes to one but if you skip the two square root of two pi you get a wrong prediction okay just because you you skipped a prefactor which you couldn't know or sometimes you do know and and there are actually people who do it wrong because they just skip the prefactor they think prefactors don't matter and but of course if you want to predict stuff they do matter and i'll just repeat what i said so first example was scaling exponents for ferromagnets and um, you find the exponent that for example indicate universal features they indicate that the class of systems have all the same exponent and for in physics if you're trained in statistical physics you will learn that many of the mean field so-called mean field um, series um, show exponent of one half which is exactly what we have uh, shown here so you classify qualitative features of the system you say okay these systems have all this this uh, phase transition at a critical temperature and the scaling or the growth of the magnetization close to the critical temperature scales as the difference the scale difference to the power of one half and what the statement is is you want to classify a qualitative feature in the other case you find the values of function at a given argument you want to compute what n factorial is at n equals 20 approximately and you want to do that by by taking another function which becomes very comes very close to the function and asymptotically the relative error is zero you find so you find values of function at given arguments and so you estimate quantitative features okay in both cases you use this similar sign but you mean something else some something different and the the right hand side um, usage stems from asymptotic analysis uh, which is a branch of mathematics and it the asym so-called resulting asymptotic scaling makes much stronger statements because here you cannot only predict how what the exponent is or whatever you predict the entire functional value okay up to some small error and again you can you can bring these into usage by combining them so there's a stronger thing which you can do um, you have for example i no, now do it only for the ferromagnet to to illustrate the point so you have the same problem you have say you have these blue data points and you want to extract features of it you see okay there's some transition but now i want to analyze um, more quantitatively what the transition is about and the first thing you do is the first thing i mentioned namely you first write that m somehow scales like epsilon to the power of beta where epsilon again is this normalized temperature and you obtain um, the scaling exponent in this limit you take log m of epsilon over epsilon and you compute beta of course if you really do that with finite numbers of data you have a problem of resolution and so on so you can't arbitrarily exactly determine it that's another story but i want to just underline the concept the concept is very uh, clear you you take the logarithm on both sides so you essentially plot the thing and you, you find what asymptotically is the best fitting line in the limit of small normalized temperatures so you classify stuff or you find the exponent once you have done that as a second step you you now don't use um, statistical physics analysis anymore and you use a second sign which looks exactly the same and um, you analyze asymptotically what is happening so you say somehow it scales like that but i want the the amplitude like what is the prefactor if i have the prefactor i can make quantitative predictions at least close to the transition point and so we can take the result of the first line of the statistical physics analysis statistical physics scaling and substitute that 
in here, so we have epsilon to the beta, and then take the ratio of m of epsilon over epsilon to the beta and find a in the limit of small epsilon. And I write these limits because usually this doesn't hold forever. For example, the square root law, as you see, can't hold if it converts to one because square root just grows, okay? Um, yeah, so, and these two steps you can in principle use both either or either for the analysis of data, you have just given some data points from an experiment, for example, no matter what the exact experiment is. If you find some, some scaling as indicated in the inset here, you can, you can do this type of analysis. You can also use that for mathematically analytical, uh, for mathematically defined functions, which physicists call analytical not necessarily analytical functions in terms of complex systems, complex function theory. Um, you know what I mean. So you know, there are two approaches. One is you are given data. The other is you are given some formula. In both cases, you can try this analysis. And the first is very different from the second, but together they are super powerful. You can classify dynamics or, or behavior, and then you can, after you've done that, you can quantify. Now I, I go to the application of um, to complex systems of scaling arguments. And I just very roughly explain what we did and what where, how scaling appears there. In this case, we'll, we'll actually do asymptotic scaling. So we reduce all the quantities appearing to effective quantities, I'll show you. And then we will actually do predictability, but we, at the same time, because it's more powerful, it somehow contains the first step. So you get both um, an argument about statistical physics scaling, like what is happening, but also you can quantify. And as a focus topic, I go for the dependency of efficiency of the collective dynamics of ride-sharing fleets on both the street topology, which is underlying the, the, right, the fleets they drive on, and the demand distribution, like who is going, wanting to go from where to where. And this is part of our bigger um, research scope on challenges and solutions for future mobility. I won't read all the problems mobility um, has. One of the most pressing ones is that it's counteracting climate change mobility Carbon dioxide emissions, for example, have not decreased as on the systemic level for uh, more than a decade, I think two decades even. So it's, it's the worst sector regarding climate change. And uh, it gets worse because of population growth and more and more people being able to, for example, buy cars, which is a good thing in principle, but it's not a good thing for climate change. And more and more people uh, Walk, uh, moving to a city, so cities grow and the density grows. And there are many people, engineers, computer scientists, physicists, all kinds of uh, innovators who say that there's, there are lots of new technologies and they will solve the problem. And uh, well, for example, you have heard of electric cars, you have heard of autonomous fleets, intermodal traffic, all kinds of things. In Utrecht, you are Probably, I've never been there, but probably you're well off because you're uh, good at biking. However, the, the technological suggestions are only one side of the medal, and the second is uh, collective dynamics. So it's a, mobility is also a physics and data analytics problem because of collective phenomena which happen. And I, although today I won't show you any solution, but I will show you how you can analyze these collective phenomena. So why we consider ride sharing? First of all, individual mobility comes with the two advantages that you can take your private car, have no, not to wait, can just start whenever you want and you don't do any detours. You just go to your destination, the time you want and the place you want. However, you need many vehicles and the total distance driven by all vehicles combined is very long, so you have a large waste factor in terms of all energy, consumption, particles, number of people employed, like if you count yourself as a driver. Um, the other extreme is public transport, line transport, 
which typically works with relatively few vehicles and uh, you, you ride much shorter distances per person. However, you have typically long detours for each individual or many individuals and long waiting times. And ride sharing is the idea of going to the middle and taking the benefits of both sides. A few vehicles, short distances, short detours and short waiting. And the idea is you have something like minibuses, for example, and you combine in a flexible ad hoc on demand manner requests by, by many individuals onto many vehicles and route them simultaneously. So it's a complex system um, which um, is a, sorry, I have to move stuff, which is a multi, multi vehicle, multi passenger, and multi location setting. So given the requests I've shown before, so you, people go from, from their, uh, from, from their starting point to their, uh, destination point and they're supposed now to run with a share with a shared minibus so this minibus is for example going here and the other one is going here so request is given by a time and a, and a place and I ignore time just to explain the problem there are certain positions and you have a planned route the planned route is the, the positions the bus will need to go in a sequence and of course there are times associated to it as I said but I go, don't go into details here So the challenge is to concurrently and efficiently plan the passenger vehicle association, like which passenger is going to which bus, and then to simultaneously route all the vehicles. And of course, it's an interacting problem. It's not a two independent problem because depending on where the passenger goes, the routing has to change. An open question is, what does efficiently plan mean? Or in other words, how does efficiency depend on the underlying street network and the demand pattern? You can imagine that uh, in mega cities, the, the topology of the street network, not only the size, but also the topology is very different in structure. Um, for example, if you go to central Manhattan, it's essentially homogeneous. It's as small as a square grid. And um, there's almost everywhere high density, in particular in southern Manhattan. Whereas if you go to Dresden or Utrecht, you would, you would see that it's a structure with, with outgrowth and decays at the, at the boundary on the time scale, on the time and length scale you want to travel. On rural areas it's even worse uh, because they are even more heterogeneous in some sense because they have differently sized cities and in between they have essentially nothing or even small settlements which you still have to serve if you are a public authority. So how can you quantify the, the ride sharing efficiency given a network? And as I said, I normalize everything. So the first thing we do is we normalize uh, the request rate, the number of requests per time, the average strip length of a, of a person, which gives you a characteristic length scale, the typical velocity of a bus given the traffic um, in, the, in the city, and the number of buses or vehicles into one normalized load X, which is the total distance. If you think about it, it's the total distance requested divided by the total distance driven by all the buses. So it's a very mean fieldish approach. However, as I said, I'm not satisfied with mean fields analysis because it actually will, so the efficiency will actually depend on the topology of the graph. Um, so L and v, v, the velocity and the average trip length, define an intrinsic time scale. And um, the average number of scheduled customers you can compute by multiplying X um, by the total time uh, associated to an individual tra uh, traveler divided by that time scale. So it's some quantity which is normalized in, a, in, a, in this given way. And it tells you how much time people spend on average on a given, on a given bus per, you know, per unit time, per, per intrinsic time scale. And if that number is large, then you have a large occupancy of, um, 
no, the large number of custom, customers scheduled. Uh, otherwise, you have a small number of custo customers scheduled per bus, per velocity, and so on. Um, now, again, I spare you details, but I show you that we consider a square grid net street network and just simulate uh, a ride sharing system on it of, of B buses, and then plot the number of customers scheduled as a function of load. So that's the average number of customers scheduled. The function of load is very simple, and, and it increases with load. That's, that's simple. The more load, the more um, you know, the more uh, you have to serve per vehicle, meaning that you get more and more scheduled customer at a, at a given time. Also clear, but not clear how, is that somehow has to scale with the number of buses, okay? If you have fewer buses, you get more scheduled customers um, per bus, so you, you ha have an increasing function, okay? And in other words, the efficiency of the entire system is given by the, uh, by the number of scheduled customers divided by the load, and then that's the inefficiency, so it takes the, the inverse of that. This is our definition of efficiency, just because the scaling of C is proportional to, is equal to X for a large number of B. Okay. Um, oh, maybe I didn't make that clear enough. So if you increase B in, in the left figure, if you increase B, my mouse gone, this curve comes down. So it gets more and more efficient the more the more buses you have. But at some point you don't get more efficient. So you end up here. And in the limit of B to infinity, you get C equal to X. So it's, it's just a, so the dash line down here is a diagonal. It's not plotted like that, but it is actually the, the identical function, C equals X. And you see that it, that it converges to it. And so the efficiency tells you um, the, the ratio of these. Um, now you can do that for different kinds of topologies. And um, the square grid is just one, it's the middle one here. But there are other topologies, which are now fake topologies, like model topologies. And the closest to a street network is probably the red one. So it's not so far away from the square grid, but it's, it's not the same. And you see that depending on the detailed topology, and you can imagine that in the in the mega city it's different than in Manhattan it's different than in the rural countryside in Germany or the Netherlands, you would um, find very different curves, which is not so surprising. So it depends on the network topology, and what also depends on the demand pattern, which is clear because you could, if you have a non-uniform demand pattern, which I didn't show so far, you would effectively not use, for example, part of the topology. If, if all the requests are on the right half of the square, you can ignore the left half. So it doesn't matter what how the topology on the left half looks like. So it somehow depends on both the combined topology and the request pattern. Yeah, so it depends on the graph. And you can say it depends on the weighted graph in the sense that there are, there are more weights uh, where there are more requests. Um, now we do exactly one thing. We we divide our we for each curve. You look, you observe the point where the efficiency gets to one to be one half. This is at a certain number of buses for each curve. And then you divide your number of buses axis by this b one half, and you plot all the curves again. You don't do anything else. And what you see, get is all these collapse onto one curve. This tells me that the efficiency is a function of the number of buses and the graph, but it's not a function of these two independently, but the number of um, the, ha the half, half efficiency value of B um, is a property of the graph. So it only depends on this property of the graph where the efficiency um, is becoming one half. 
Okay, but still we don't know what that is. And I, I sketch you a bit of how we get there. So a single parameter B one half captures the dependency on the graph. So far we have only done numerical analysis. We have plotted the data and replotted them in a clever way. We did the same for real, real graphs, so not fake, but not model street networks, but real street networks, for example, Berlin Mitte, so central Berlin, Bornholm, which is an island, Göttingen, which is the place we started the project, the Isle of Man, Mallorca, Manhattan, and so on. And you see that, as expected, they, the efficiency are all different, but if you plot them in the exactly same way, they all collapse, at least for a large B. So again, a single parameter B1 half captures the dependence on the graph. And this work is published um, by Nora Molkentin, uh, Marta Schröder and me in the last year. So far, we, we have been focusing on uniform request rates and on infinitely large buses. And as I said, I can argue away with the uniform request rate because the request rate and the topology form one quantity, if you wish. It's a very complicated quantity, but it tell it's one effective topology given the demand. And now I got, go from this complexes to even more complex settings where I want arbitrary request rate distributions, which is not trivial, but it's a, it's a one step thinking process. And then there's a com more complicated aspect, which is finite capacity. So far, everything was infinitely large buses, which is not realistic because if you have only 14 seats, but you want to um, keep 15 or 20 people in that bus, it doesn't work in reality, at least not in Germany. The examples from uh, South Africa, if you look uh, into your favorite video streaming platform, um, you will find uh, there's ex at least one example where in a 14 theater you find, I think, 48 people working out. But uh, in a more um, strict setting, this shouldn't work. And the question we address now, I'll just mention that, is can you reconceptualize these, this new system with, com with capacity and constraints towards the results we had already until then. And um, they are now um, given any request. So you want to start here and you want to go here. There are certain types of buses. So the, the light gray buses are those which are just too far away from your request to be reasonable to serve you. Then there are the dark gray buses where the they are nearby, but they are currently planned route because of the other passengers in there or to be to be in there in the future already scheduled. They prohibit the delivery, so they are go going in the wrong direction. So say you want to go this way, and this bus might go that way. Then you don't want to take that bus, so you can ignore that. And out of the remaining buses, the, these are the green and red ones are all those which are going the right direction at the reasonably right time. Um, <clears throat> so in an unconstrained system, the red and the green ones are available if you didn't have capacity constraints, but now some of them have capacity, all of them have capacities. So you, you're constrained by capacity and the red ones just can't make it. And then you can compute, and I don't show you why because of time constraint, but you can compute an expression or an estimate of how the the probability what the probability is that a bus out of the green and the red ones is actually red in the sense that it is not available for you because it is already occupied or to be occupied by its own schedule so it is supposed to pick up passengers in the future such that you cannot accommodate you then the only thing we do here is we replace the the effective and the, the, the B by an effective B, the number of buses available is just one minus P full times the number of buses. So you reduce in the entire system, you reduce the number of buses entering your scaling analysis. And then you, you do the same, you take the same function F and put it back in and observe the same thing. So there's again a universality which is robust under capacity constraints. As I, as I mentioned, there are now the two aspects of scaling. The first is you find universality, 
And the second is we can actually, because it's based on asymptotic analysis, I'll sketch it on the next slide. It is um, also quantitatively predicting what's going on. And yeah, so this is just an illustration. If you do that, you get the efficiency as essentially one curve. You see that if the fraction of full buses is very large, so super high uh, occupancy of every, everyone, then it tends to deviate a bit, but you get the trend still even for those uh, data points. Not, nothing compared to the non-normalized uh, version I showed you before for the two uh, unconstrained cases. So again, for the unconstrained case, I, I, I sketch how the scaling analysis works. You define your efficiency and note that we define an efficiency in a dynamical sense. So we observe, we have a dynamical observer, which is the number of scheduled customers. You divide by the load, which is a normalized request rate per bus and per distance or time the, the, the bus can travel. Um, and then we compute this C, but this contains two expected um, times. Um, it's a time scale uh, for waiting for a bus, and we can find that, which is proportional, no, sorry, this is actually asymptotic to tau, which is the intrinsic time scale, some gamma, which I'll let you know in a minute, and, and this uh, anti-proportional to, to B, inversely proportional to B, the number of vehicles. And there's the uh, uh, delivery time, which is asymptotic to, is, uh, to the intrinsic time scale. So what this results in, if you just plug it in and take compute this quantity, it results in that one. The, the efficiency is asymptotically scaling as a very simple function. It's one over one plus gamma over B. And this is actually the black function here. And the dots are now data points from the unconstrained system you see two things. First of all, for large B, it very well fits. For small B, it does not entirely fit. There's a deviation. But the data points still fall on top of each other, which is somewhat surprising because we don't, we have don't, no, don't have any uh, uh, explanation for why these data points fall exactly on top of each other. We do have an explanation why this needs to be the case asymptotically as B to infinity. I, I forgot to mention, because it's too cluttered otherwise, but all these expressions are asymptotic in the sense of some quantity going somewhere. And here it's for B to infinity. So these ones are all read as B to infinity asymptotic expressions. And as we have seen from the data, the rescaling factor was B one half, the number of buses you need to get half efficiency. The, the theory gives me a gamma, which comes from an, another contribution I don't talk about. Um, but the interesting thing here is that from the theoretical result, this one, and from our data analysis, that one, you can very easily identify what B and B one half actually is, it's just gamma, okay? And then we, we are investigating nothing to do much with scaling. We are investigating a cause of um, the underlying topology variation. And our current hypothesis, it, it has substantially, uh, it is substantially driven by a correlation between uh, the B one half, like the, the point at which, by which you normalize, and the total length over the average shortest pass length. So um, you can say the it is driven by the overlap of shortest paths given the topology and given a demand pattern. So you can compute for each uh, tour where people start and where they end. They have shortest paths they would go through if they just took their own car and given the topology. And you do that for everyone, you ask how much do they overlap? 
And um, well, in some sense, it's also a scaling relation because it's, it's now a, a algebraic scaling here, but essentially it tells you it's a, some kind of correlation, um, a nonlinear correlation between these quantities. So we are currently working on asking what, how this shortest path overlap actually contributes. And if we know that, we can actually design improved, meaning more efficient, right sharing systems given any new city or graph. So summary, I first confused you by two simple examples and uh, let me know if you are confused enough or have been confused enough. And the take home there was you can either classify by scaling analysis or you can predict which are two different types of scaling analysis making also two different statements. One is statistical physics usage of this similarity sign. And the other one is the asymptotic analysis usage, mathematics usage of asymptotic uh, equivalence. Then I sketched an application in complex systems and focused on collective dynamics of right pooling systems um, and both for artificial graphs and real street networks, which are these two examples we find this collapse for large B, like the num large number of vehicles, which is clear because you can't expect any universality for a small number of vehicles, and also not, to be honest, for small request rates, if there's just, it, if it depends on the realization of your system and you are lost. Um, but also it works for the unconstrained system, which are these two examples, and the capacity constraint system, if you correct for the fact that not all buses are factually available for you, although the buses are nearby and they go in the right direction just because they occupy. And with that, I come to the last piece I promised uh, to thank you, all of those still awake. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark, for this nice talk. Really nice example also. Um, so I, I, I guess, uh, you know, there will be questions uh, by the audience. I see already one in the chat, but anyone, you know, can, uh, if you want to ask a question, please do so in the chat or raise your hand. That's also possible in Zoom. So maybe Jaap, can you ask the first question? Yes, I'm willing to do that. Um, you know, there's this idea about fast thinking and slow thinking. And actually the fast thinking is mainly what I think is following your intuition. So when you do slow thinking, you think a bit more about it and come to a different conclusion. But what I'm amazed about, can you explain why my intuition would deceive me in relation to this uh, uh, first um, sort of the pull problem you posed? I, I can't hear you. Ah, oh, sorry. Um, as I don't know how your brain operates, because you said you were deceived by the problem, um, what, can you specify what you actually would like to know? Well, you, you mentioned by double rotations that in the end, actually, the North Pole comes more, the, the so-called North Pole comes closer, denser distributed near the true North Pole. Whereas intuitively, I would think it would be distributed uniformly over the whole globe. And that exactly. is apparently wrong thinking. Yes. That and is the intuition then not giving me the right sort of answer. Um, yeah, that's it. I can, I can, I can tell you what, what my, why my intuition would have given the same answer like uniform. Um, if you think about it, we are used to random variables which are uncorrelated or at least weakly correlated. What is the case here is you are talking about random variables, rotations, which are completely correlated. You take the first rotation is exactly the same, the same realization as the, no, the second is the same as the first. So you, you pick one random rotation and then you apply that one twice. Oh, I see. I thought actually the second one was also independent of the first one. But that's no, it's two times R, two times the same thing. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. The interest is still the intuition is, is biased by, by what you know from, from two dimensions because there it is, is 
uh, uniform. And for a large dimension, it is also uniform uh, in the limit of the dimension to infinity, just intermediately is not. Okay. That's what I found uh, very fascinating about. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, I see a question from Violetta. Uh, yes. Um, so I was wondering, does because you you mentioned there's some um, some of the quantities like the b number of buses l trip length etc. So I was I had like two questions if I may. So the average um, trip length, for example, is this a quantity which depends on time? Because I can imagine that uh, like in rush, rush hour, for example, then the trip length yeah. should take much longer than uh, like off rush hours etc. Yes. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, 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 how does this also depend on time? Yeah. So, so for for everything we analyze, this does not depend on time. We have all the quantities fixed. So, we have a fixed number of buses. We have a fixed request rate constant in time. We have a fixed average trip length, which essentially means two things: the um, and a fixed velocity, which means means two things. That first of all, it's it's homogeneous in space, and it's also homogeneous in time, because if it's not homogeneous in space, it would cause inhomogeneity in time. And also it means that the, the, the ride sharing traffic does not make up the majority of the traffic. So essentially on a time scale of your driving, it is fixed. So you can imagine you, ride, you take a ride sharing system in a city, which is not dominated by the ride sharing, it's just dominated by the cars. And you take it in the morning, then your effective velocity will be um, will be lower, and your request rate of number of people asking for the service will be higher. You can also say, but but at that in that one hour, say between whatever seven thirty and eight thirty, the number of buses is roughly a constant. The mm -hmm. number of the velocity is roughly the characteristic velocity is roughly constant because you may have congestion, but then it's low. Uh, we, it, it becomes problematic if the if the quantities change dramatically on a time scale of individual deliveries. So if you if your trip average trip time is twenty minutes, but the, the but the request rate changes on a time scale of ten minutes, then you have a problem. But if it typically it's varying over hour hourly time scales, and if your trip length in terms of time is not tip to duration is not too long, then it's a pretty okay approximation. Mm -hmm. Just you would, to actually model it, you would need to take your real velocities and, uh, and request rates as a function of time of day and change it, adapt it accordingly. And then you can get variations, which is true. For, and the only statement I can make so far mathematically and from a data analysis point of view, is that if they are actually fixed, then the scaling must hold. If they vary, you will get deviations. If they vary too quickly, which is my physics understanding of it, they will completely look different. You can, for example, typically there are two peaks in, in demand, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, later afternoon, which are the commuter or going to work and go from work. Uh, demands. Um, there are sometimes there's a third peak in the in the evening, like after dinner, or after whatever seared uh, people going home. Mm -hmm. um, but as, as I said, as long as you, if it if they vary on a reasonably slow time scale, you can just iteratively adapt, and you will get quasi stationary results for each fixed uh, lambda and v. And also, as an operator, you can decide to then adapt b. Right. For example, mm -hmm. I want to stay at the same efficiency, then I know I can predict how to change B. Here it looks like I can just adapt it for the same X, but I want the same efficiency you can. So you have to change B accordingly such that the, the efficiency curve is the same, which is not the same as just cancelling out in this very simple term uh, over here. Mm -hmm. and if I may, a small second question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I was wondering also about uh, finite size effects because in your curves, efficiency curves, you're plotting against uh, theoretical value B. 
uh, exactly for example eh, which uh, which goes to like infinity but of course this uh, number of maximum buses depends probably on the city on the capacity of the the, the, the city etc so so um, if one is correcting for that so like for example per city um, taking into account that there's a maximal number of uh, public transports available and then you get some finite size effect so so i was wondering how this look would look like or if you maybe have looked at it at all or not we have um, not systematically analyzed it but we have seen it obviously mm -hmm. um, because we have run simulations and uh, compared to serial analysis across as you see here across a given where's my mouse a given number of hmm, interesting my mouse is Invisible for me, at least. So in the in the graph here, you see that the curves are dependent on the number of buses in the system. So each yes, yes. time you take a given speed network and a given number of buses, and you ask what the efficiency of the system is as a function of the number of buses. And then later, you have seen that these collapse. But even further, for the real ones, which are the more interesting ones, um, you see that asymptotically it's the same. So for a large number of buses, it doesn't matter. It is, I mean, formally, mathematically, this entire statement is valid as B to infinity. So only like in the limit of infinitely large B. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But factually, it goes down until B over B one half is approximately one, which is pretty impressive, I think. Mm -hmm. I, it's not our fault. We, it's not our achievement. <laughs> it just happens to be like that. Um, uh, but it's, that is certainly a finite size system. So in other words, you can run a, a reasonably small city with, say, of the order of 100 buses, and you are still described by the asymptotic limit of infinitely many buses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, but you, you, you have a valid point, right? If, you, if you're going to a sparse number of buses, then your, your, your universality breaks down. And at the moment, it's not completely clear at which point this happens and exactly why. Also, it's not clear. Where is my, ah, yeah, sorry. The system is a bit slow. Hmm. Oh, no, it's later. Huh. I, sorry, my system is super slow at the moment. Hmm. Okay, maybe I ever find it. You maybe remember, remember that the analytical prediction did not fit the data, the rescale data for small b, although the rescale data overlapped in the rescaled regime here. Yeah, so that is, it's also not clear at which point this happens. Like why that happens exactly here, we have no clue. It's just the finding. And theoretically, the only thing we know is that it must be correct at very large B. Okay, oh, that's interesting. Okay, ah, yes, thank you, thank you. Thanks for the question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Jaap has another question. Let's go ahead, Jaap. Yes, um, my question is, how does this, how does the setup of, say, Uber fit in, which is, I believe, I don't know exactly, a system where the taxi waits at the end of a previous trip and when I call for a taxi, the nearest one will pick me up. And then at the end, it will stay where I want it to be. And then it continues that way, particular way. How that, does that fit in, in this particular theory? It doesn't. It doesn't fit because um, we, our assumption is that the number of... So Uber is, is either having one person. Uh, sometimes they have a sharing option, which means two people or two parties. It could be two groups of people. Um, and very rarely they have, I think, four, up to four people in one car in a special, special service, but that's not the typical uh, fleet Uber operates. So this one does not describe an Uber, current Uber services. By the way, we have a nice related question, uh, study on the question of, of sharing in an Uber-like service, which comes out next week, I think. So I can send it to you if you want. Okay, thank you. But it's not about this type of scale. Okay. Okay. Any more? Any last question to Mark? 
from somebody. I don't see anything. Okay, well, uh, let me thank you again, uh, Mark, for the nice talk and also for nice answering the questions. And thank everybody for attending uh, this afternoon. And uh, we'll have a next meeting uh, at uh, next week on uh, Thursday also with uh, Ian Cousin from uh, Constance will talk about collective intelligence. So I uh, hope to see many of you there. Again, have a nice uh, rest of the afternoon and bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you, Thank much you very much, Mark. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Thanks. bye.